Just over four years ago, our guest and my friend, Henrietta Four, became the seventh executive director of UNICEF. Uh, in terms of humanitarian assistance and human development, there are a few posts more important in the world than that one. Of course, she came to that job with lots of experience from being the first woman to lead USAID, to the undersecretary for management at the State Department, to director of the US Mint. I could go on and on. Henrietta, it's great to see you again. Mark, it's great to see you. Thank you. Well, and, and as, we, as we're talking, you're about to uh, retire or leave from UNICEF. So I don't know if this is popping corks or shedding tears, but in any case, you're winding down. Congratulations on all that you've done and, and your fantastic record of public service. Uh, thank you very much, Mark. It's, it's actually been very emotional leaving because um, this morning, one group said to me, you know, you leave a little bit of you with each one of us. Well, each one of them have left something with me. So it's rather hard on the heart to have little pieces coming and little pieces going. But it's a, it's a wonderful experience to be able to serve the world and to try to make the world a better place, as you know, Mark. Well, and, and as I said, there are a few posts that are more important in the world than UNICEF, uh, especially right now with all that's going on. Is, is you and I say in almost every conversation that we have, uh, the world's on fire right now, and there's a lot to be taking on. And uh, obviously at UNICEF, it's all around the world, every corner of the world, a lot's going on, lots of challenges and lots of opportunities as well. Yes, it's, a, it's actually a very challenging time. And as I look forward, Mark, I think that the world wants to see more stability. And it's stability from both conflicts, but also from natural disasters. And so one of our missions at UNICEF is to create stability in a country, in a community, in a family. And that is an important skill and a set of programs that I think are useful for the world at large now. Yeah, it, it, and also I, I take a look at this moment in history and we're seeing record levels of displacement. So we're seeing uh, children, families, not where they were, not where they're going to be. Increasingly children being born displaced and growing up displaced. And of course, that means a, a lot of work, a lot to be done for UNICEF. Yes, and that sense of belonging, of belonging to a family and to a community is going to be very difficult for children. Um, childhood is different now than it was when we grew up, Mark. And I think we're going to be seeing a whole new generation because of the pandemic. Um, some children react to it with fear because they're being displaced, as you speak about, and anxiety and depression. Others with anger. Um, and so we will have to think as a world on how to help this next generation um, so that they are leaders, so that they feel empowered with the skills and the knowledge that they need to lead the world. And I think we can do that. And places like UNICEF give you that in excitement and the, the excitement and opportunities, the possibilities that lie ahead, because we deal with young people. You know, and, and you're pointing to something very important. We've, we've talked about it a number of times. So uh, we see these heartbreaking scenes on television every night. They're humanitarian disasters, some of them natural, some of them man-made all over. And obviously, we need to help meet those humanitarian needs. It's a moral obligation that we have, a moral imperative. But at the end of the day, real compassion is more than humanitarian assistance. It's also a ladder out of dependency. It's a way out, a brighter future. And that to me is the most important work that you're doing in many ways. And if I can say, I think really the innovation that you brought uh, to UNICEF at this moment is, is not only dealing with the moral imperative, but also looking toward the future. Yes, it's very important <clears throat> because um, listening to children, you see that they're thinking in the future. And thus you have to think about what would make the world better in the future? What could happen that would help us? And one of the areas that we've been working on with our USAID, Mark, is you know, primary healthcare. You know, during the pandemic that that's what we needed. We needed community clinics. 
or you could take your children and go in for your routine immunizations, that there was water at the clinic, that there was a doctor and there were some nurses and healthcare workers. But we need the young people now to train as healthcare workers and to train as teachers. We need education for everyone. So that emphasis on development, long-term development, as well as the immediate humanitarian crises is a very important linkage. It's a, it's a continuum of life. And it's something that UNICEF and USAID both do very, very well and often together, which becomes a powerful team. Well, and, and as I said, you certainly came to this role with all kinds of experience, USAID and elsewhere, but it's still, there had to have been surprises for you when you got to UNICEF, I mean, COVID, of course, but beyond that, what surprised you about the work at UNICEF? Well, the breadth and depth of the skills at UNICEF uh, were something I had not really understood. It's a remarkable organization, and it is one that was built by America, and it has a long string of American directors and executive directors. So many of the solutions that are there uh, can be a pattern for other entities and agencies. So uh, it's, it's a wonderful testament to American ingenuity, but also American ideas and ideals and values, uh, which is it's wonderful to see, but you see it then playing out all over the world because we're in every country in the world, but we focus on children and young people. So if you're under 18, you're UNICEF. Well, and, and you're really getting at a couple of things I wanted to touch upon. So uh, you talked about it a bit, but talk a little bit more about the importance of the U.S. role with respect to UNICEF. So UNICEF focuses on nutrition, education, health, water, sanitation, protection, mental health, girls and young women, climate change, all sorts of subjects, and all that affect a complete life of a young person. So it becomes a place where one can invest, one can invest for the future. And that means that we can also use public-private partnerships, Mark, something that you and I know carry great power. And they are particularly important in America. So it is a, uh, a resource uh, that I think uh, is just unbeatable. So as you look at the portfolio, last year we set upon the idea that we needed to focus on a few areas immunization to save lives. And that has proved important, not just in routine immunizations in polio, um, but now in COVID. And we are getting out um, vaccines to half of the world's children. And now we've just passed the milestone of a billion COVID vaccines that have gone out to the world, 144 countries. And this is a time when immunizations are really important to save lives. And the second area we focused on was education to save futures. We want to connect every school in the world to the internet and every learner, every teacher to the internet. We can see distance learning now is an essential part of education systems. And it's just, it's the beginning of an industry, Mark. It's, it's not something that we know well now yet how to do, but we will get there. In this decade, we will understand remote and distance education. It's a huge opportunity for both public and private sector alike, and for every country. And obviously for the children, it's the best ladder out of poverty that we know. The third area that we focused on is water to save lives. We need this for climate change. We need this for healthcare systems that often, as you know, in let's say Sub-Saharan Africa, a health clinic or a hospital will not have running water. It means that a doctor cannot wash their hands for surgery, um, you know, with infectious diseases. It's just essential. But water is also necessary for nutrition purposes and just for the many who are in need, whether you're in South Sudan or Yemen or Syria, you need clean, clear, potable water. And the fourth area that we focused on was mental health. 
to save families. Mental health, as you know, Mark, has really become an issue. We didn't talk about it much in our generation, but this generation wants to talk about it. And we all now realize in the pandemic that it's important. We need more research. We need to know how this, how, how mental health is impacted. It is a young person's problem. Usually most of the elements will come into play by the time a child is 14. And um, the 80% will be in place by the time a child is between 22 and 24. So with that in mind, we have to address mental health early. And this generation wants to talk about it. And it, it's, it's uh, in families. It's, it's because of physical violence or sexual violence. It's because of online violence with their friends. But it's an important area. So all of those are important. And we now have realized that we've got to add nutrition to this. Because um, as you know, in the Horn of Africa and Afghanistan, um, I mean, so many places in the world, there is just a lack of food, much less nutrition for children. So it's everything from micronutrients um, to clean water to, to food, and it's for the whole family. Uh, but it's, it is a time in which these initiatives and these organizations can really help the people of the world. So it's a wonderful time for American leadership. You know, uh, one of the most striking things I think about your leadership and all that you've done is uh, your relentless optimism. Uh, you just mentioned a few of the countries, and it's tough, as we both know, some of the places where we work, some of the places where we visit, and we see the plight of children, the plight of some. Yet every time I talk to you, you're looking forward, you're looking ahead, and you're talking about what can be. So so uh, tell me, if you look back on four years, what would you say uh, gives you the most reason? Best day, what was your best program that you worked on? What do you take away as being the most hopeful part of the work under your leadership? Well, that's a very big question, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so let me tell you some things that I loved seeing. But then, Mark, let's go into the future. All right. So, so um, when I visited Lebanon in the Bekaa Valley, we were dealing with many of the Syrian refugees who were coming across the border, and they wanted to have school for the children. And the Lebanese school system came up with a two-part system where the Lebanese children could be taught in the morning and in the afternoon, the Syrian. It meant that you would be there when the schools were coming out and schools were coming in and the parents would talk to each other. So there was a sense of Syrian Lebanese uh, camaraderie among the parents and among the children. So you could see social cohesion beginning and it meant that, that education could continue. I love to see solutions when you're in a place where they're doing something right. Uh, later, I also went to go visit a gathering of girls, adolescent girls, 2,000 of them, all of whom were in IT. Girls got IT. Girls got it, of course. So they were shoulder to shoulder, sitting down with, with women who were in professions, uh, one thing or another, and they were learning what they did with it. So I went into a classroom in which there was an architect, an urban architect, who was showing the girls how you design apartments and then green space around the apartments and what you could do online with architecture, with their skills. They were so excited. Then the next room was robotics and what you could do in healthcare systems. It just meant that they were thinking about opportunities. They were seeing themselves in the future, what they could do. They were feeling their own power, the power of knowledge. And that I think is extremely important. So. So in the future, what I'm hoping we can do more of is um, to reimagine education. I think it could be for the world like the Green Revolution. I think that we could bring a quality education to every child in the world. And I think it would be within the national curriculums, but also outside of school. Because now, Mark, as you know, everyone's carrying a cell phone. So I would hope 
that we could do that. And with the technology that lies in America on lower satellites and Wi-Fi and connectivity, I think we can connect every school in the world. And if we could, then the half of the world that is not yet connected could be. And this would be just a great change for the world. And, and I think it would propel our civilizations forward in a way that few other investments could, but it would be a public-private partnership, just like the creation of vaccines. Right. So uh, I'm gonna get a little more practical um, with you because I think one other part of the work that UNICEF does that I think is in the American interest and yet we don't talk about very much. So as you mentioned, UNICEF's basically everywhere in the world, including in places where Americans can't get to or don't want to get to for various reasons, security, whatever it might be. And so we look at what's happening in Afghanistan as we speak. I think one of the great roles that UNICEF plays is with American support is able to advance humanitarian goals, which are American goals in places where Americans simply can't go. So it, it seems to me that that is a major uh, reason for American support of UNICEF, it's a way of accomplishing goals without, quite frankly, exposing Americans to places that are tough for Americans to be. It's an excellent point, Mark. And, and I agree with you. Entity like UNICEF, because it is part of the United Nations, means that it is it carries no politics with it. It is uh, nonpartisan and it, it carries two mandates, the humanitarian mandate, which says that you will save a life, um, irregardless of who it is, where it is, uh, you will save the life. And the development uh, context, which means that you want peace and prosperity to come to every country and that they will become friends of America. So it is important that America's ideas and ideals are carried to these places, even when times are difficult and they are difficult in these countries, as you say, but we are working hard now. And our teams in Afghanistan, um, we stayed when uh, many of the countries pulled out their uh, ambassadors and missions on political basis, we stayed because we are humanitarian and development. And as we began to move, we are now working in the health sector. We hope to be working in the education sector because it would be a great waste if we did not let girls particularly come back to school in March after the winter break. But we want girls and boys in school at all ages. And it only happens if we stay there, we stay and deliver these kinds of programs. Part two of the practical side of this, uh, I think Americans are about the most generous people in the world, yet there's always a concern about money going astray. There's always a concern about fraud and about waste and about abuse. And I can say as a former administrator at USAID, when we approached the UN and said, look, you know, we want to make sure we understand where money's going and see proper accounting, uh, UNICEF under your leadership immediately came forward and say, absolutely. A and talked a little bit, uh, if you would, if you would talk a little bit about some of the measures that you've taken to ensure that there's accountability, to ensure that there's transparency, and to ensure that uh, particularly US money goes to the intended places and the intended parties. Yes, um, it's a very um, well understood concern and it's an important concern. I mean, all of us care about our own households and where our money goes. So you don't want the money wasted or you don't want it to go to um, a government that would be corrupt or mis misuse it. So um, Mark, you and I both have had experiences in business and to me, UNICEF should be run like a business with its controls in place and that we are giving excellent reporting, that we have audits, investigations, and that we are very, very careful with money. Um, we have clean audit opinions. We, we spend time with it. Uh, I spend time with it. And as a chief financial officer, as the top executive 
you have to do that. Uh, but attention is one thing. What all of our people do is excellent reporting also. Um, you know, reporting is important to donors so that when USAID is investing in a program, you know the time frame, you know who will be involved, what its objective is, and so does UNICEF. And that's a very important teamwork concept. We often do it with nonprofit organizations, both local ones as well as international ones. So part of our mission is also to make sure that their systems work well for the reporting and for the audit trails so that the money is used exactly where it's supposed to be used and that we are getting good leverage from it so that a dollar invested can produce $5 worth of benefit um, within the country, within the program. And so, so it's a very important concept. Four years. How many countries did you visit? <laughs> I was just uh, reminded of this yesterday in our town hall, 39. 39 and, countries. <laughs> um, and, and I must say that many of them were because of uh, some uh, disaster, let's say Mozambique after Cyclone Edai. Uh, but others were for just good development purposes. But both have important parts um, and important messages and lessons for all of us. So, uh, you know, one of the great things about working in development and foreign assistance, international assistance, is it's a politics-free zone. It's a place of continuum where we each try to contribute something on top of what our predecessors uh, were able to accomplish. What are you proudest of in terms of developments at the agency uh, under your leadership? Well, each of the initiatives that we have, I think, have the ability to change the world of the future because we invest in the future since we invest in children. Um, but, but they have that capacity. So reimagining education is a great goal for our world. Um, it is the best ladder out of poverty to get a good education. It is portable. Uh, it is something that if we can give it to every child and young person, it would be a great gift. Um, I think that it's also extremely important when you look around the world to think about that issue of public-private partnerships and what could be benefits for America. Well, I think education is just at the beginning of a, an era and American companies uh, would do well to invest in education and in distance learning. We have much to give, but it could be like the Green Revolution. So I hope, uh, I'm very proud of it. I hope that American industry will stay with it. Microsoft has been a good partner uh, with the Learning Passport. You, uh, Mark, have been very um, focused on migration and on refugees. It, this is a great benefit when you can keep up with your home curriculum in your home language as a refugee or a migrant, uh, because we all need skilled young people. And if you can do that, if we can give you the platforms in a public-private partnership with a US company, that would be great. But we also have great generosity. So UPS, for example, um, uh, lent us a plane uh, so that they would fly goods to Venezuela for the people in need there. American companies can be very generous and they can give us in-kind support. And as you know, the Gates Foundation along with USAID and Rotary um, have been helping us on polio. Uh, without that work as a team, polio would not be close to extinction in the world. Uh, so these are great public-private partnerships and I hope they will continue. And then lastly, um, We've had a big initiative on culture change. Culture, as you know, Mark, is very difficult. But the world woke up with the Me Too movement and with um, racial equality. And we are a very big multinational, multi-ethnic, multi-religion organization. And we have been focusing on becoming a respectful and kind workplace that we carry it into our homes, in our offices, and into our countries. And it's changing things. We are close to our values now of care, respect, 
integrity, trust, accountability, and sustainability. So I hope all of these will continue. We all build on each other's work. Um, but UNICEF is a wonderful organization. And I've been very proud and very privileged to be able to serve. USAID, State Department, UNICEF, uh, any over the others? Well, U.S. Mint, it's not in that same US, that's big right. world. <laughs> but U.S. Department of Treasury is another, uh, is a, is another great gift. And then, Mark, as you know, all of the nonprofits that we serve with and for, they're an integral part of America. And then I love corporations. So serving on corporate boards is another gift. And you, you realize that these worlds all intertwine and connect in a very important and powerful way. It means you can change the world together if you just act as a team. You know, I think that in many ways, that's the part of development work and humanitarian assistance that Americans don't know and don't really appreciate. 50 years ago, there are relatively little American corporate interests in the developing world. We really didn't have the connectivity. Now we do. And so the opportunities to harness private enterprise, some of the supply chain, some of the skills, some of the materials, it's extraordinary. I did not really have an appreciation for how far things have come and how far they can go. So um, uh, Americans, American business does have business in the developing world. And if we can just break down any remaining seams and barriers between the public sector and the private sector, you're right. Uh, the, sky, the sky really is the limit. Henrietta, thank you for everything that you've done. Thank you for your service. Uh, you have done a remarkable job. I can say that who's someone, as someone who has seen your work in action so thanks for it all and look forward to staying in touch. Uh, don't be a stranger to the Wilson Center. We want to tap into your experiences, to your ideas. There's a lot of work yet to do. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. There is a lot of work to do. I won't be a stranger. That sounds great. Take care. Thank you.